We praise you for this, the first day of the week. And we thank you for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And we praise you that this gives us hope for this life, whatever the circumstances. And we give you thanks that it gives us hope for the life to come. We wait before you and ask now that you will send your good and life-giving Holy Spirit upon us and within us. And we pray that you'll anoint my, my lips that I may articulate the good news of this passage. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will take our minds and think through them. And we pray that through our time together, you will deepen our love for you and for our neighbor as we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Now, uh, we're, we're not all muted. This, uh, I, so, Terry, uh, J Tim, if you can double check the muting. <clears throat> um, now, we're on today, we're on uh, Romans chapter 11, <clears throat> and this finishes up a, a three-chapter unit, and I haven't decided yet as to whether I'll do a final session on the whole three of them because they raise, they raise such important theological questions. So here we go. I'm going to read the passage. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, and do you not know what the scriptures say of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what's God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So as to make Israel jealous, now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, here's Paul changing his subject. I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as fruit for its fr first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the, among the others, and now share in the nourishment of the root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. But then you'll say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. So note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's, God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. 
and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from, for, for if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these and natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of the mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, who will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable, inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has a gift, has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things, and to him be glory forever. Amen. Now, in this chapter, Paul continues to address the fundamental question that's been at the heart of material from chapter 9 onwards. And he writes as a heartbroken Jew who is deeply concerned because so many of his fellow Jews have not come to faith in Jesus. Now, this troubled him because these were his kinsfolk. These were his relatives. And these were the people who had been given absolutely incom incomparable gifts by God across the ages. And now, when they see or hear Paul, they drive him out of the synagogues, and frankly, they look upon him as an apostate. They look him in the eye and basically say, You're, you have betrayed the very cause for which you were born. You're a traitor to the covenant of Israel. Now, worse than that, if that was not, not bad enough in the eyes of many of those who oppose Paul, he's also an innovator, because what he's doing is out there converting Gentiles. Now, why on earth would you go and convert riffraff Irish and riffraff English and riffraff West Texans? I mean, God help us. We're, we have enough trouble with the people we've got. Now you're going to let in all of these, all of these deplorables, all of these riffraff who have no place in the people of God. And so Paul is facing an acute, two acute sets of problems. One, he's seen as a betrayer, and the other is he's, pollu he's polluting the very heart and soul of Israel. Now, as we work our way through this passage, I, I want us to bear two things in mind, and they're very, very important. The first is that if you look at first century Judaism, this is the time in which Paul is now preaching and teaching, it's actually made up of a whole network of sects and interest groups. The, Israel has never been a uh, kind of a monolithic group of people, just as I think the church has never been a monolithic group of people. But even if you read the Gospels, you'll see you have a network of people called Pharisees, you have others who are called Sadducees, you have the Herodians, you have political zealots. These were the functional equivalent of terrorists in our day. And you have, for example, a group that said, a plague in all your houses. All the establishment is corrupt, and uh, you're a bunch of apostates, and we're going off to the desert. Uh, these were known as the Essenes. Now, if you, if you go to one of the great museums in Jerusalem, for example, um, there's one of them that has this incredible model of the old city of Jerusalem before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. 
And right next to it is a museum of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it turns out this was a group who had taken to the desert. And when I was uh, in the museum and listening to the absolutely brilliant uh, person in charge of it, it sort of struck me, here's a group of people, they preserved intact, by the way, a crucial uh, manuscript of the book of Isaiah. I, I was really struck. These people, these were Jews, and they thought the whole thing was rotten from top to bottom. And so they simply said, to hell with the temple and all of that nonsense. We're going out and we're going to create a pure group on our own out in the desert. And so what I want to get at here is that Judaism, first century Judaism, was not a monolithic group of people. Now, the second point I want to get across is very important as we move towards the end of this passage. Is that, is that Jesus was a Jew, and the earliest followers of Jesus were clearly Jews. All of the 12 apostles were Jews. The earliest converts were Jews. Many of them actually, as we know from Acts, uh, were priests in the temple. Thousands of them were converted in, in a certain period. And so the earliest version of Christianity was actually a form of Judaism. Um, tempting to call it Messianic Judaism, but that's got all sorts of connotations that, that are not maybe very happy. So what Paul's dealing with here is not Judaism or the Jewish people in general. It's just a crucial point. What he's dealing with is one particular group within the cauldron of the Jewish uh, people in the first century uh, of, of the time of Jesus. And it is this group alone, I want to argue, I would want to say, that Paul's arguing with. <clears throat> and it is this group in particular that was such a disappointment to Paul. And it's the unbelief of this particular group that Paul is trying to understand. And as we've seen, he is in chapters 9 and 10, he has one basic explanation uh, as to why they, what, what's at stake here. Uh, the, the reason for their unbelief is that they had made up their own theology as to how you get right with God. They all agreed that we need to get right with God. The issue is, how do you do it? And they'd said, okay, the way to get right with God is by works of the law. And so when Paul comes along and says, look, you got that wrong, and actually this whole system is bankrupt. It, I tried it and it didn't work. <laughs> um, the system that really works, which is true to Israel, is a system called grace, and it involves grace and faith and the generosity of God. It involves taking God at his word in coming to us in repentance and faith and opening ourselves to the reality and power of God. It's not a matter of, of earning brownie points with God. It's um, fundamentally a matter of operating on the principle of divine grace, the response of faith, and then faith working it itself out in love. Now, uh, I want to tell you something about Texas at this stage. <clears throat> Some of the most original research relative to what's be the first century Judaism came out of Texas. And actually, uh, the person involved was, grand, was born in the grand metropolis of Grand Prairie. So there you are. <clears throat> His name actually is E.P. Sanders, and he went to Texas Wesleyan to begin with. Then he transferred over to Perkins. Then he went to Union Seminary, he spent some time in Jerusalem. Uh, and I'm happy to say he ended up as a professor of New Testament at no, no lesser a place than Oxford. And what, I, what Sanders did is that he cut behind a lot of the Reformation disputes about the understanding of the gospel and the Paul and went back and really did his homework on the sources of uh, first century Judaism totally transformed, by the way, the whole of that world and our understanding of it. And people like N.T. Wright, my good friend, Bishop Wright and others, they are actually, in many ways, part of a whole research agenda. So not only did they draw attention to the diversity of Judaism, so that you have this one particular group involved, but here's the, here's the astonishing discovery that they made. If they're right, I think it's amazing. And the discovery is that mainstream Judaism, if you took the the, the aggregate of the mainstream as a whole, they actually understood the principle of grace. And they had a vision of, of the relationship with God where basically 
uh, I put it in my own vulgar way, they, you get in by grace through entirely as a matter of the generosity of God, but you stay in by your works. Now, this will make people's hair stand on end, as it does all the Lutherans and all the Calvinists that are out there. But actually, you have exactly the same position worked out in Wesley. Um, and I'll not go into the weeds on that. But what, he, what Sanderson Company showed, I think, or at least they argued very persuasively, that the mainstream Jewish position was, in fact, that you got in by grace and you, you stayed in by, your, by being in a, a faithful to God. Now, the obvious analogy here, and it's not an analogy that's foreign to the Old Testament, is the analogy of a good marriage. I mean, you, you don't get into a marriage because you have proved your worth by some set of works righteousness. You get into a marriage because of, of the free decisions and generosity and love and care of the people, the person that you've fallen in love with. But how do you stay in the marriage? You've got to keep the relationship alive. So you get in by grace and you stay by, if I can put it in the, terms of the theology here, you stay by works. So uh, what Paul is doing here actually is that he himself is representing mainstream Judaism. And this the minority report that he's arguing with here, namely that you get in on the principle of, of the law and of works was indeed a minority position. So what I want to get at here is that what Paul is arguing with, who he's arguing with and the unbelief in particular that he's trying to deal with is the unbelief actually of a particular group, a particular network of people within the Jewish tradition. And even some of these after they became Christian, when Paul would go on his missionary journeys, this must have been a real thorn in the flesh for him, they would come around afterwards and say, look, oh yeah, you've got to keep the Jewish law. So this was a very tangled question in the early church, and Paul is wrestling with it here. Now, eventually I get to the chapter. It divides nicely into three units, and it deals with this fundamental problem of this, 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 this network of people who have, op have decided to operate on the principle of law and of works rather than the principle of grace. Now, what Paul does here in the first 10 verses, um, I'm going to summarize, is that he says, yes, it is the case that a significant number of, of Jews have said no to Jesus. Um, but that's not the whole story. If you look at the history of the Jewish people, there have always been those who've, who've sort of backed out of their relationship with God in any serious way. But there's also always been a remnant in Israel who have operated uh, on the basis of grace rather than law. So the fact of the matter is God has never rejected his people. Uh, there's always been a remnant of people who have stayed faithful. And because God has foreknowledge of these people, this is not a problem for God. You see, otherwise people will say, well, look at the risk that God has taken if it's going to be dependent upon human decision, human repentance, dependent on people actually saying yes to God, which I think is exactly the case. Uh, people are going to say, well, goodness, that's a risky business. Well, not if you have foreknowledge. And so God knows exactly what, what he's doing. And I think God doesn't just have what's called simple foreknowledge. I think he knows, in fact, what people would do in different circumstances. So what's at stake here is that uh, Paul says, look, the problem has never been that God has rejected his people. It, the problem is that people have rejected, in the Jewish tradition, God's way of becoming right with him, have turned it upside down, and he judges people who take that route. Now, that's really where our, our hair stands on end, because what he's saying here is that what God did to Pharaoh and his obstinacy and his rejection of, of, of the will of God, uh, he, he's now doing actually to those who adopt a principle of law rather than of grace. And that is a devastating criticism to make at this stage of, of a Jew. But Paul is very clear about this. And he quotes two passages. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear, down to this very day. By the way, this is taken up in the Gospels and Mark, it's taken up in Matthew, it shows up actually as a crucial issue, because uh, God is intimately involved with everything that happens, so all of these writers are wrestling with this issue. And the core of the issue is that if you decide to do it your way, a la 
Frank Sinatra and work on the principle of, of law and of works rather than of grace, then there are consequences to that. And what happens actually is that you harden your heart, God hardens your heart, your heart is hardened, and it, it's a very serious situation to get into. This is not a trivial matter. Now, a second unit, and I'm not going to cover everything in this passage, but the second unit deals with an extremely interesting move that Paul makes. Because what's happened is that in the rejection of the Messiah by um, some of the Jews, lo and behold, Gentiles have come into the kingdom of God. Now, Paul how that happened, but he's, he has, he certainly has in the back of his mind, he has an idea that, well, given that uh, the Jews said no to this gift, the Gentiles who were hearing about this said, well, we'll take it, we'll have it. And they did. And so what had happened was that the rejection by some Jews of Jesus had motivated, in a way that Paul never explains, certain Gentiles to come to faith. And now Paul makes what I think is an absolutely fascinating move, and I'm going to bring out the significance of this further at the end. He says, look, um, now we can turn the tables. What if the conversion of the Gentiles, what if God uses that to actually convert those Jews who are in fact working on the principle of law rather than of grace? And you have to use your imagination at this stage to figure out what, what that might look like. And I think it would look like something like this. I mean, here are these pagans, complete pagans, and the Jews are looking at them and saying, I mean, you commit idolatry, you're knee deep sometimes in sensuality, you're a disaster. And they come to a Jewish Messiah who's risen from the dead, who gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit, and lo and behold, their lives are completely transformed. So the attraction of the new life that Christ brings, both in terms of forgiveness and in terms of attractive holiness is what I'm going to call it, and people are going to say, well, oh, maybe I was working on the wrong principle. Why don't I get on board too? So what Paul is arguing here, isn't it, isn't it the possibility wonderful that God will now use the conversion of Gentiles drawn to Jesus in order to motivate uh, those Jews who are operating on the wrong principles to actually get with God's program and come over into the kingdom. And then there's an amazing twist at this stage, a twist that I'm haunted by as I, I think about this. The twist is then the Gentiles Hello, is everybody there? Yes, I was wondering if it was me or if Billy was the one that cut out. I'm here. Yeah, I think I think Billy cut out. Let me yes. give him a call. Brad? Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if, since we have so many people in the class, which is a good thing, we have to upgrade our Zoom to include more people. I think Tim's got the upgraded version, don't you? Oh, great. Yeah. I think you're good to 250 people on Zoom. That's not and a good <laughs> Basic Zoom is good up to 100 people, so. No, well, the account has the capacity, but I can't explain this other than internet problems on Sunday morning. Hey, class. Uh, Billy got disconnected, and he's working on reconnecting with us. So let's just give him a moment. Uh, Tim, if you want to quit recording and 
uh, we'll we'll start it back up when Billy gets back on. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, <laughs> I was just about to hit my uh, hit the hit the climax at this point, so let me make it again. Well, what Paul's been arguing is that he's he's hoping, and in fact, he believes that through the providence of God. Uh, the conversion of the Gentiles will motivate Jews to become followers of Jesus. And then he realizes, oh goodness, well, what happens if the Gentiles, uh, uh, rather than seeing this as a, a wonderful opportunity for God to act, use it as an occasion for pride and arrogance. And Paul basically says, well, you'd better watch out now too, because if you go down that road, you're going to be cut off. And uh, hopefully you're not going to do that, but the good news, in other words, is that if you if you do if you receive this and interpret properly what's going on here, uh, what what's at stake is that you're going to um, you're going to be used by God. Your conversion is going to be used by God to draw people, to draw those who are those Jews operating the principle of law uh, into the principle of grace. And then one final point that Paul makes in this, in the last section of this, he looks to the future. Now, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of uh, speculation as to how exactly this is to be interpreted, but I think this, it's straightforward, broadly what's at stake here. Paul says, look, this hardening that's come over uh, this, this whole sort of trajectory part of uh, Judaism, it's not gonna last forever. Um, at present, the these folk are enemies of the gospel they 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 don't like it they prevent it being heard but one day one day actually they're going to sort of wake up and in the grace of god they're actually going to come in so at some stage there's going to be a massive turning of the jewish people to jesus um after all uh all of us have been consigned to disobedience. All of us have fallen into disobedience. And we Gentiles have, and, and Jews uh, have discovered the grace of God. So it's perfectly possible that down the road uh, that what's going to happen is that the, all of the Jewish people, the whole of them, are going to find, uh, come to a point where they realize, in fact, that Jesus is the Messiah. And then you're going to have the full inclusion of uh, the Jewish people at that point. Now, this is uh, an amazing, amazing proposal because what, what Paul is arguing is he, that it's, at some stage there's going to be a massive conversion of Jews to the Christian faith, to a genuine Christian faith, not some sort of just nominal Christianity, but to a deep, genuine faith in Jesus. And he's prepared to leave all of that in the hands of God, as he says here, who has known the mind of God or who has been his counselor or who has been, who has given a gift to him that he might, might be repaired, paid. This is all, all in the hands of God and God will work that out in his good, in his good time, good time, as he puts it at the end here, for from him and through him and to him are all things and to him be glory forever. So he cannot believe that uh, that God has abandoned forever, even those who have, at this stage are enemies for the gospel's sake. He can't believe that these will be abandoned. These people would be abandoned forever, and that eventually, actually, the Jewish people will come around. Now, I'm going to make two propositions as I bring it to an end, but let me just say uh, these are very deep chapters and I've not covered everything that should be covered. I'm in deep enough water as it is. Um, clearly there's a very deep doctrine of providence at work here, that God is at work in, with, and through everything that happens, including our unbelief and our belief. Um, it's, it's an amazing, amazing vision of divine care and that God works through absolutely everything to achieve his purposes. There are very deep questions about predestination and free will and the possibility of universal salvation. All I'd want to say to you is here that um, if you get deep into that water, never forget two things, that God wants everybody to be saved, and there's mercy available for everybody. Uh, and that's why I find ultimately the Calvinist reading of these texts uh, totally unconvincing, although I could make a case for it if you wanted to, if you wanted me to as a, just as a, as a, as a scholar, 
But I'm not persuaded by that because I think it undermines the universal call of God and the universal mercy of God to everybody. And of course, there are deep questions here about the relationship between Jews and Christians. And it's two propositions in that that I want to finish with, and that are, are that, that may be provocative, but there you go. Um, the first is, if you look at what Paul says here in the middle section about hoping and trusting that God's going to use the providence, his providence, use the um, conversion of the Gentiles to create jealousy among Jews in order to bring them to faith. And then he gives the warning. Now be very careful here. Do not fall into pride or into arrogance. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think actually that Paul's hopes at this stage of what providence might do were not fulfilled. Because I think what happened very early on is that the Gentile converts ultimately uh, took a stance of incredible arrogance uh, towards the Jewish faith and towards the Jewish people. And, and as a result, as a result, in some cases, in fact, in many cases, it's made the conversion of Jews all that more difficult. And the failure of the Gentiles at this stage, in my judgment, was a dramatic failure of holiness. They, 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 they were not intoxicated with love for God and their neighbor. And their earliest neighbors in the ancient world, in some cases, were Jews. And over a long period of time, actually, uh, the, the Christians and the Christian church in the West and in the East developed the most virulent forms of anti-Semitism uh, that you can imagine, uh, which were only surpassed by, in my judgment, the Nazis. Uh, now, this is a this is a very strong claim that that I'm making. Uh, you you can see it in very earliest fathers, even in, in Ignatius in the first century. You see it in John Chrysostom. You see it in others. For a long time, Jews and Christians were were very close to one another, and even some Christians went to the synagogues. And by the time you get to the fourth century, they're forbidden to go to the synagogues. And so you get this massive rift between the two. And in the 13th century, um, in Spain in particular, anti-Semitism became an appalling development, uh, even down to the point where Jews had to wear a particular uh, badge, which, which was what the, the Nazis copied later on. They were expelled. They were expelled from Spain, ended up in Eastern Europe. And, and you have then a history of savagery. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. Absolute savage, savagery committed against the Jews by what I'm going to call, uh, in many cases, an utterly nominal Christians. And this reached its, its, its uh, way right into the heart of Christian teaching, uh, uh, where Jews were considered to be cursed, because somehow they, rather than the Romans, for example, had crucified Jesus. Um, and this remains a sore point, to put it mildly. Um, and uh, theologians are working on this point now, and, and a lot more work needs to be done. But I think one of the issues that comes out of this is that the failure of what I would call a conspicuous sanctity, the failure to live out the faith in a way that avoided the arrogance and pride of Gentile Christians over Jews, initially over Jewish Christians, and then over Jews, is one of the one of the darkest tragedies in the history of the church, for which uh, the church and Christians must take responsibility. Now, a lot more could be said about that, but I, I that's a, that's the first preposition I want to make. And the second one is even maybe even more controversial. Um, I think even when you have unbelief among uh, within the Jewish tradition, and is heavily testified by the Old Testament, just as the unbelief within Christendom is heavily tested by history. Um, the survival of the Jews is one of the most amazing sort of providential acts, in my judgment, in the whole history of the world. And it's mentioned here in passing. It's just a phrase, a throwaway phrase of Paul. He says, now, these folk who are not coming on board 
are enemies of the gospel, but they're beloved for the patriarch's sake. New English Bible translates it, they're still friends, God is still friends with them, even though they have rejected the Messiah. Now, what this means is, is that God's faithfulness to the children of Israel, to, and I'm going to put it very crudely, to the biological children of Israel, to the biological children of Abraham, is irrevocable. And the faithfulness of God does not depend upon the good works of human agents in this case. Uh, I would even go far as to say it is a standing um, wonder and marvel, the existence of the Jews down through the centuries. Uh, it's put beautifully by uh, some, of the, some of the stuff I've read. I mean, have you ever heard of Hittites? I mean, Hittites, you only know about Hittites because of the Jews. But we all know that the Jewish faith and the Jewish people have survived all of these years, uh, despite the most appalling efforts to destroy them, eliminate them. And this continues right up to this day, because there, there, there are whole nations, there are whole groups that would happily annihilate every man, woman, and child that exists within the Jewish people. and. What's astonishing is their survival. Now, their suffering is another issue, but what's astonishing is their survival. And I think that survival is predicated on when God said to Abraham, you know, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and I'm never going to go back on my promise. He really meant it. And of course, what, what that means is that God's faithfulness in his promises are irrevocable. Um, some of the promises, of course, are, in, uh, are conditional, but I think this promise is unconditional, and it's a way of saying that, that God is, is going to stand by the word that he gave to the patriarchs of old. And in and, and my judgment, just as a footnote, I think actually the rebellion uh, against uh, the treatment of the Jews is ultimately a theological issue. I think it's, it's the effort by human beings and by apostate Christians, for that matter, to eliminate <clears throat> Uh, the the people of God who are the Jewish people, that itself, it seems to me, is a massive rebellion against God. And it's one of the massive sort of responsibilities or uh, challenges that the Jewish people have on their shoulders from one generation to another. That that because God has been faithful to them, the, the those who want to rebel against God want to rebel against the activity of God and the promises of God and one of the ways they'll do that, of course, is that they will, they will attack those who follow Jesus, but they will also attack those who have got any connection whatsoever to God's chosen people at this stage, uh, whom I'm identifying as the biological children of Abraham. Well, that's uh, my word for today. It's, we've gone into some very deep stuff, and um, uh, I may take another week just to go back over some of this, depending on the, the questions. Uh, and uh, so now we're open for comments or objections or questions, and, and I hope I, I hope I, I don't lose you at this stage. I have a question, Karen Hallmark. Hello, Karen. Hi. Um, this passage, some of this passage has always confused me. I'm not sure, especially about when Paul's talking about a huge conversion of Jews coming to Christ. Is this a, a hope on his part? Is this a prophecy? Is this a instruction? I, I, I've never understood what this is. Um, I, think, I think it's a deep conviction um, that it's, 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 it's <laughs> um, he can't believe that the people of God who have received so much of his hand and who have been and to and and to whom God has been so irrevocably committed, I think he can't believe that one day they won't come around and 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 come and accept the Messiah that's been given to the Jewish people and to the Jewish people first. So I would say it's it's not a hope, that's too weak. It's not a prophecy. I think that's too strong. I think it's a simply a deep inference and deep conviction that he arrives at as he begins to ponder who God is, what God has done 
in uh, his uh, promises to the Jews. And I think it, it, it's uh, his conviction, it, it also derived from that if they really stop and, and look at Jesus with uh, an open mind, actually that they'll come on board. So I would say it's neither a prophecy nor a hope nor a speculation. I think it's a deep conviction that this is, this is the way it's going to go. Okay. I, I think that's two lovely questions. Uh, to, one is that, is that the arrogance and the pride and the uh, majority, there was a majority. I mean, one way you can think about it initially was you, you start off with Jews who are Christians. You have Messianic Jews to use that expression. And they are so successful at evangelizing the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are so, Paul is so successful, that eventually the majority in Christendom becomes Gentile. And it, 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 there's a lot of historical work on, on how it uh, emerged. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in the, in, the in the Roman world. And undoubtedly, some of that baggage was brought into the Christian faith by Christians who were Romans, that's to say, who had, who had been identified as Romans before uh, and after they became Christians. But it still doesn't get at uh, how deep this runs. And I think it, the, this is where eggheads are so appalling, because once this gets up and running and you get this uh, sense of arrogance and, 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 and uh, privilege, you then invent theological doctrines in order to defend it. And even someone as brilliant as Karl Barth in the 20th century, who stood up against Hitler, considered that the Jews were basically under a kind of curse. And that became actually the standing teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It was embedded in the liturgies of the Roman Catholic Church. And this was not removed from the Catholic Church until Second Vatican Council. And by the way, it, the, the background story of this, I don't know all of it, but part of the background story of this is that there was a brilliant Jewish historian and he got, got, became friendly with certain key people in the Vatican and certain leading uh, Catholic scholars. And what he did is that he convinced them that, that the anti-Semitism that had been embedded in the very liturgy of Good Friday, for example, was it was that was wrong, and they could remove it without ceasing to be Catholic. And John, Pope, Pope John, uh, John the Twenty Third, uh, was the one who first saw the implications of this, and then it was absolutely worked out over a period of time within the Catholic Church up into Vatican, uh, Vatican Two, and that was a I can tell you that was a landmark decision to get that eliminated. So I'm going to put a lot of responsibility here on the uh, on theological, very, very serious theological missteps that were made within the whole of the Christian tradition, uh, and that's East and West. And 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 once you get it put into the liturgy, then it's a uh, with, where, where many many Christians across the world uh, actually get uh, hear this. This is this is very difficult to eradicate. So that, that's part of what the answer would be. Now, this, the, the second question, um, I, I think at the end of the day, what's at stake here is the secret of all evangelism. Um, now, I don't think you can have evangelism without what I would call uh, winsome proclamation of the gospel. Uh, and sometimes we've been good at that and sometimes we haven't. But here I'm with the reformers, I'm with Wesley, I'm with the whole evangelical tradition um, that, uh, you know, Paul's our argument last week, how can they hear without a preacher? The good news has to be proclaimed. That's a crucial element of evangelism. But the, the, the way in which people often are most effectively reached is not by proclamation, not even by high-powered arguments and apologetics, but it's really by conspicuous sanctity. It's really by uh, being fully intoxicated with the love that God has made visible in Christ and makes available to us through the working of the Holy Spirit within our lives. And, um, and I, maybe I'm just showing my Methodist underwear at this stage, but I, I think that the, uh, the, the, the deepest 
so, well, I'll put it this way, one of the deep, deep causes and reasons for people being converted is that they simply say, I want what you've got. Uh, I attest to this in my own life. Uh, I was deeply puzzled by the content of the Christian faith. I mean, I couldn't mm -hmm. make any sense of it. Uh, but I knew these people had something really important. And when I read the New Testament uh, late at night when everybody was in bed and I would read Paul and the J.B. Phillips translation, I said, this is, there's something deep going on here. Now, I don't have a clue what it is. I, 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 maybe it's something to do with God. It's something to do with Jesus. It's something to do with the Christian life. But what really got me was the love and care of very ordinary, uh, mm. non-conspicuous Christians who showed a love for me and for my family, which, which I'm, I still step back in awe. Now, I don't want to say that that's the whole story about evangelism because people are converted in a host of different ways. But I think what Paul is, one of the takeaways from here is that the most effective witness that you can make is, is one that exhibits utter humility. Um, one that says, you know, uh, all I want to do is to share uh, in every way possible the love and grace of God mm. and, and, and let it be visible in what I am and what I do. I think that's what Paul was hoping for. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure there were Jews who were committed to the principle of law who were converted precisely because here were these riffraff coming to Jesus and the Jew who wanted to be holy, truly holy saw a holiness that they could not attain in this other way. And that's, that's then, that, that really was a kind of uh, massive epiphany for them. So that, that's how I'd answer your second question. Thank you, be beautiful, Billy, thank you. Um, Arvel, could you hold on for just a moment and let Peggy have a follow-up question and then Arvel, could you go after her? Hi, Billy, I didn't really have a question. I just felt compelled to make a comment because this comes at such a striking time for me. Um, so my mother was a German Jew caught up in the Holocaust and her whole family had to escape. And one brother was shipped off to Australia. Another family got to America. My mother family was put in internment camps in London. Anyway, the whole time they were trying to get rid of the Jews. And this week, for the first time, the next generation, me in the United States, my cousin in Australia, the son of my uncle in Australia, and one in London and one in San Francisco, we all got on a Zoom, Zoom call. We're all Jews. And I, I think as I'm listening to you, oh my gosh, how true this is this week for me to see that even the Nazis, that, that we still are getting together in another generation and the Jews keep surviving and we're all over the world. So I had to say that was very timely for me that I had this first time ever cousins Zoom call of, of Jewish cousins. I think this, that's a beautiful word. Um, and I, I mean, you, you probably detected that I'm doing a fair bit of reading, not central to my current research and writing. Um, but I, I've, I've been reading about the Jews in, in Warsaw and Vilna and what they went through. And, mm. and it's, it's very interesting, actually, the, the, that, that just to get to the, the issue of divisions, which is at the edge of your comment. But there was, there was a, a very, very famous uh, Jewish uh, scholar. He was called the genius of uh, Vilna. Um, and, you know, he was a child prodigy who, you know, by very early age was sort of who, who knew Hebrew and, and, and was was already studying the, the Talmud and so on. And he went on to become, I mean, one of the most extraordinary scholars um, in the Jewish tradition. But he had a, a massive falling out with a group called the Hasidim, who were pietists um, within Judaism. Judaism has its own version of Methodism, if I could dare put it that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> And what you had was this sort of, and it's a, it's a similar dispute within the Christian faith. Those who, who say, you know, all these holy rollers and enthusiasts and Methodists and God knows what, all these fanatics who want to get up and dance before the Lord uh, and, and be full of, you know, effervescent uh, uh, spirituality. And then you have, like you had with this genius of Vilna, 
this amazing, you know, in a way, rationalist. I mean, he, he knew the texts unbelievably, almost off by heart. And, and he, he set out to totally undermine and destroy any way he could the influence of this other pietistic group, as I'm calling them. And uh, so, you know, what's new under the sun? And I tend to want to say that we need to, when we look at the Jewish faith, we, we need to step, take a step back and figure out where the parallels there are as to what's happened within, if you like, the Jewish version of Christianity, <laughs> or within Christianity as, of, as a branch of, of Judaism that emerged out of the first century. Um, and it, it, it's a very familiar story once you begin to dig down in it. And, but of course, the most appalling part of all of that was that uh, the whole of that world, I mean, the, the Jews from Spain, for example, were expelled, many of them went into parts of Russia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, down to Hungary, down into Romania. And they were wiped out. Uh, it, it, it's an, an appalling story. And, um, and they, they were wiped out from Russia by people who were Orthodox Christians. And they were wiped out by gangs of, of nominal Christian uh, uh, groups, uh, thugs. Um, and their survival is an amazing phenomenon. It's an absolutely amazing phenomenon. And so uh, I think maybe I'll take a whole session and go back at this. I'll look at this again next week. Because uh, here's, here's the final question, uh, a final comment I want to make on your wonderful, wonderfully sensitive remark. I sometimes wonder, uh, is it the case that many Jews have never been able to hear the good news of Jesus because of us. Mm. Is, it, is it the case that nominal Christianity has been a curse? This is a, a, a real curse because in certain social and political circumstances, it, it turns on the, the, the God's own people represented by the lineage from Abraham. And so what are you, what, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the, this, but it seems to me that it's very understandable of certain Jews, given the history that you're describing in your own family, and, and that this was brought about at the hands of those who were wearing crosses or were, who were doing it because they were convinced that the Jews were cursed by God and this was appropriate punishment on them or whatever. I mean, how, how are you going to ever hear the good news of the gospel if that's, if that's all you've known? And if the only version of Christianity is one which is nominal and utterly impotent as far as, as, far as deep love and understanding is concerned. Um, and I, I think we've got, to, we've got a lot of thinking to do about, about all of that. And of course, we leave everybody in God's hands. Uh, we, we're not the, ult the, the judge of people who are in, who are out at that stage, in my judgment. Uh, but of course, Christians down through the years have wanted to say, we know exactly who's in and who isn't. And if you don't agree with me, you're not in and I'm going to kill you. I mean, we've done that to one another and we've done it to the Jews. And of course, it's happened in other religious traditions. It happens in the secular world as well. So we have a lot of thinking to do as to how this radical evil actually gets rampant in our midst. And Billy? one of the things that American Jews are very unhappy with with American Christians right now is as we present ourselves as the victims of persecution with religious liberty, which in many ways we are, I've heard many Jews say, how dare you whine and complain when you're a majority about being persecuted when you've never cared about our persecution. We're the persecuted ones. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, it sure is, it sure is. I'm not going to. I'm not going to handle that to this this morning. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I think you just got to be very human in dealing with all of that, in the sense that you need on. You absolutely need to understand. Um, and if I had that, that would be that. If I had a conversation with a Jew along those lines, I'd have some fun. But we're going to leave it there. Yeah, uh, Billy. Yes. A uh, quick comment and a question. Uh... I think one of the most, one of the saddest and most sobering experiences of my life was visiting the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. Yep. And for the first time really coming to understand 
some of how the church uh, began to experience and 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 uh, and live this anti-Semitic uh, attitude toward toward our Jewish uh, Jewish friends. Uh, it was really heartbreaking. The the question uh, Dennis Prager, whom many of us uh, know, um, has a high respect for the Christian Church, Christianity. Someone asked him what it would take for him to believe in the Messiah or that the Messiah had come. And he said, well, for him to bring world peace. And if someone brought world peace, he could believe he's the Messiah. I know there's some who believe in the day of the Lord or the eschaton, that uh, there will be a turning to Christ uh, because of the developments in terms of, of world peace and whatever. You have any comment on that? I think that's a lot of nonsense. <laughs> Uh, that's rather brief and uh, to the point. There isn't going to be any war of peace, um, my judgment. Um, uh, I, I think that, um, I mean, the, the wider issue here is, is, is there's a dispute between, say, a wonderful figure like Prager, um, I've met and enjoyed, come, enjoyed a lunch with, a dinner with here in Dallas, wonderful individual. Uh, I mean, part of the dispute we have with friendly Jews is we have a different view of what are the marks of the arrival of the Messiah. And uh, they look at uh, the Christian claims about Jesus and say, well, this can't be the Messiah because he doesn't do things like bring world peace. Well, uh, I don't think that's the way to tackle that question. Um, I think you've, you've got to go back into the New Testament and the Old Testament and, uh, and, and look much more carefully about what the signs of the Messiah are, and uh, then you can have a proper dispute and debate about fulfillment and how it is that Jesus fulfills the signs that are identified with the Messiah. So, um, I'm, I'm, forgive me for being rather abrupt on that, but I think um, maybe it's my Irish background uh, where uh, I think the, that we're going to have massive struggle between good and evil, between massive geopolitical forces in the world. I mean, we all know right now, uh, China has, we've been awakened to the fact that China is uh, attempting to really re repeat what happened with the British Empire. Um, if any of you want to follow up on this, there's a, a brilliant set of uh, YouTube videos or lectures by Stephen Kotkin, K-O-T-K-I-N, and you'll have to dig around, but there's a series of lectures he gave in uh, Austria uh, in which he, he, he lays out the tensions in the, in the, in the geopolitical arena. Um, and so anybody who comes along and says at this stage that, that we're going to have war of peace and then we'll believe in Messiah, uh, no, I'm not, uh, good luck. You're, you're never going to come to the Messiah if that's the case. However, that, I don't want, rather than finish on, on this issue, on that rather uh, tough note, I want, to, I want to make a friendly note. I think it's one of the most wonderful things about the United States that we have created a society of genuine freedom in which now Jews and Christians can sit down together and actually uh, uh, not just be friends with one another, but learn from one another. Uh, and I, I consider it one of the most amazing things um, to have happened in the 20th century. Uh, for centuries, for centuries, the enmity has been such that there was no communication of any serious uh, sort. It's commonplace now <clears throat> in my world, and, uh, and so much so that there's just this massive, there's a massive dis debate and dispute about how to handle the deeper questions about the relationship between Jews and Christians. And uh, I now will read, as a matter of course, um, Jewish material on the Old Testament and even Jewish material on the New Testament. Uh, this week I read a, an amazing piece by a, a lapsed Jew, actually, a, a more David Daub is his name, uh, on uh, treatment of, the, of uh, Judas in Matthew's Gospel, which I so absolutely astonishing, full of insight. Um, so, and I want to come back to this. Where but in America would you get this? Where but in a world where you have created a political system 
which is committed to the rule of law, which is committed to the uh, to civic society, which is committed to freedom, which is committed to tolerance. Now, all of those things can be undermined and uh, and and they can be at risk. But the conversation between Jews and Christians uh, of the sort that's now emerged compared to what it was in the past, I think uh, there's three cheers for the American. Uh, political system that's made this possible. Uh, does, does anybody else have any questions for Billy before we wrap this up? Hi, it's Glissy. Glissy. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are a number of points I would like to talk to you about, but um, just on that world peace thing, uh, I think uh, from Paul's perspective, Christ did bring world peace because the enmity he saw was between God and mankind. And, and it's Christ who solved that enmity. So I think he would say Christ did bring world peace. Does that make sense? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think you're equivocating, my dear friend. Uh, well, I, think, I think most people would think that world peace means peace between people. Well, and I think that's the right way to think Paul about it. it. Paul sees it as peace between God and people. Yeah, but that's not... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm having fun with you, forgive me, because you're so smart. <laughs> but, I mean, no, I think, I think you're dead right. I mean, but... The, 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 here's where I would go with you. The, the really, I mean, a lot of people think that the, the only problems that we have to face in the world are the, the, the interpersonal, international uh, problems. The, the disputes between Catholics and Protestants in the north of Ireland, the disputes between, you know, the various versions of Muslims in the Middle East, the dispute between the Russians and the Chinese, or whatever. Um, and those are those those are in a secular world those become the, the only issues that people want to discuss now what you and paul are banging your drum on which i think is beautiful is look there's a deeper problem here and the deeper problem is the enmity between god and human beings and that's exactly what christ has bridged and it might well be that if we could give more attention to that problem and think through how that could be worked out in the wider world, we'd actually make some progress. Now, theologians have been working on some of those issues, but I, I, I'm, I, I, I love the way that you're making that move. And in that sense, there's a deeper piece that's been brought to the world. And uh, I think the follow-up on that would be, if, if that's really true, then uh, what difference does that make to all of these other disputes that we've got? Uh, and it can start with the dispute between Jews and Christians and uh, say, and, and work through that. And then it can certainly extend a lot, a lot beyond that. Do you have one other point where you could illuminate us again, Glissy? I'm sure you do. <clears throat> well, uh, way back when you um, translated the word unrevocable. Irrevocable. Yes. What difference do you see in that word and unreg unregretted? Oh. Oh. Because in the, uh, in the Greek... Unregretted, unregretted would mean that there was no regrets about the decision God made. Right. But to, make promise, to make a promise to Abraham and his progeny forever. I lost you. Irrevocable I lost you. Isn't that component in it. Hmm. Too bad. Do you think there's a better way to translate? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm actually, that's my, uh, my rendering of what I think is the deep theological point being made, but I may be missing something here. I, I, I certainly don't think God has any regrets for what he's done. Right. Well, the word, I, I lost all of your answer because you cut off, but um, he does not regret the, the promises because look at the results some people have accepted it oh. but irrevocable means that i would think that he cannot take it back and oh. i don't think that's the issue the issue is not can he oh, take that's it? a good point 
That's a good point. I think I want to do a little bit more thinking about that because I, I didn't have that in mind when I used that word. What okay. I want to get at is, is that when God gives his word, he's not going to back off on it. And that's the difference between a lot of human agents and, and the divine agent. Um, and so, I mean, when God says yes, he means it. Every yes is a yes. It's true. But, but I don't that's think that's, for. that's true. But I don't think that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying he doesn't regret it. Uh, and the verse you're appealing to is? Uh, the gifts and calling of God. Oh, yeah. 29, I think it is. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm very willing to, I mean, I'm very willing to, um, to accept that improvement on excellence. I think that's a, be that's actually a beautiful way to put it. God has no regrets about what he did. Right. Uh, which is deeper than he simply says, okay, I've given you my word, so I'll stick to it, you know? Right. Uh, th that's too weak a term. Wouldn't that be true? I think so. Yeah, I think you're right there. You brought me on board, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we should... Um, uh, spend a moment or two and, and see who we want to pray for today. I